questions. You guys still have questions. So I'll, I'll get started. Um, uh, thank you all for being here. Um, uh, I wasn't expecting so many people, especially on this first Monday back from the spring break. Um, so uh, I'm Jordan Carver. I met many, but not all of you, so um, nice to see some new faces. Uh, this research, I'll go over it a little bit in the talk, but it's uh, I'm basically going to read a paper that uh, I'm presenting at the Society for Architecture Historians in about a month. Um, this is research that I've been working on for the past few years. Um, it started out as doctoral research, and now it's working its way through the manuscript process. Um, I was explaining to Chong that um, it's it started before Trump, and it's a project about the U.S.-Mexico border and the architectures of the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and then, of course, it became something, well, the project didn't really become something different, but our attitudes towards the border have changed or sharpened. Um, and so I, I'm not, I'm, I don't know what to think of this research, um, so maybe you guys will have thoughts on that. Because um, I, I haven't presented it very often um, and I'm continually working on it and thinking about it. So anyway, that's my preamble. Uh, AJ, I don't think he's here, he's in his office, but thanks to him for setting this up. Um, and so like I said, I'm gonna just kind of like read this text, um, and you can just like jump in if you wanna ask questions or clarifications or you know whatever. Um, um, so, uh, a lot of this, uh, so this little section of this chapter um, is concerning obelisks and the initial monuments of the U.S.-Mexico um, boundary that were installed in the 1850s and 1890s. Um, after the Treaty of Guadalupe, Hidalgo was ratified by Mexico and the United States in 1848, ending the U.S.-Mexico War that had begun two years earlier. A binational commission was created to survey, map, mark, and document the newly defined international boundary separating the two states. The initial 1848 to 1855 boundary survey resulted in 52 monuments, uh, mostly like this, small pyramid-shaped stacks of nearby rocks, although some were made of stone and concrete forming small obelisks. These monuments were documented by the commission in a series of etchings and illustrations. In this, documenting the physical manifestations of the boundary architectures has been integral to the U.S.-Mexico boundary since its very inception. The monuments were arrayed, often with great distance between them, on the land border between El Paso, Ciudad Juarez, and um, San Diego and Tijuana. In 1891 through 1896, a second commission was organized to survey the boundary line with the latest cartographic technology, draw maps with increased fidelity, and once again, document the monuments, at this time with photographs. The second commission refurbished the exi existing stone monuments and placed smaller cast iron obelisks at increased intervals on the boundary line, bringing the total number of monuments to 258. And this is a, um, one of the photographs from the second commission. Uh, the, boundary, the boundary surveys were time-consuming work, conducted across different difficult landscapes requiring uh, several different teams, starting points, and even new treaties to rectify ge geographic anomalies and inconsistencies. And as much as the commissions were framed uh, or formed to mark the boundary, they were also uh, established to bring some sense of understanding to the newly created American West, a landscape seeped in mythology but lacking any sort of, sort of comprehensive understanding within the power centers of the American state. The figure of the landscape as it, under, as it is understood, as much of the construction as the monuments and maps, relies on previously established systems of knowledge and political ideologies. Landscape, according to W.J.T. Mitchell, is a, quote, medium of exchange, unquote, a, quote, naturally, natural scene mediated by culture. It is a discursive object existing as much in what can be described as a natural state as it does in symbolic form, containing the ideals, notions, aspirations, and ideologies of its representational logics. For the survey teams, the ideology of imperial right and racial domination were foundational to framing, relating, surveying, constructing, and penetrating the landscape before them. Quoting Mitchell again, landscape should be seen as a, quote, dream work of imperialism, 
unfolding its own movement in time and space from the central point of origin and folding back on itself to disclose both utopian fantasies and the perfect imperial and perfected imperial project in fractured images of unresolved ambivalences and unsuppressed resistance." Unquote. And so for today's presentation, as I said, um, this is a small piece of a, a paper I'll be giving at uh, SAH um, and a larger chapter in a book that I'm working on. Uh, I'm addressing several of these utopian fantasies and unresolved fractures of the boundary line by analyzing the material artifacts, those monuments, noble pyramids, uh, erected by the early boundary commissions. This requires both a material analysis of the monuments themselves and an analysis of the monuments as a media and as media objects, for the monuments have never meant to be solely experienced or consumed merely along the boundary line. They are objects of transmission. They circulate through the media, through political discourses, and through popular narratives and mythologies. I mean, the wall, right? Um, they are, in short, part of an aesthetic narrative that, quote, pictures the nation, unquote, through tropes of racial hierarchy and virginal emptiness. Uh, throughout 1851, the Monuments team of the Boundary Commission, working from San Diego to the Colorado River, was overseen by Captain Edmund Hardcastle and his Mexican counterpart, Ricardo Ramirez. By most accounts, the two teams worked together, and due to funding and resource disparities, the surveys relied on each other to produce measurements and cartographic data. Similarly, they often split the task of erecting monuments, lending laborers and materials between commissions, comparing locations and measurements, and improving each other's work. The binational um, monuments placed between the land border terminals was a simple design. Informal obelisks of pyramidal forms constructed in nearby rocks and covered with locally made mud and plaster. In contrast, the Pacific Monument, oops, sorry, uh, the Pacific Monument uh, was made from marble nearly 12 feet tall and pyramidal in shape. And from the summit of the pyramid, a flame is represented as rising from a circular bowl or urn. That's a uh, design description from the Boundary Commission. The design in that sense mimics a diminutive form the obelisk erected in St. Peter's Square, the Vatican seen here uh, in 2004. Obelisks have long served as trophies for conquering powers, removed, stolen, and reconsecrated in prominent public spaces. The victors of imperial warfare used obelisks to symbolize their enemy's defeat and as prominent political symbol narrating foreign victory at home. The elongated pyramid has a long history as a monument in form of military triumph, both of armies and individuals, which is to say the obelisk has a long association with the state form and with the mythological status of the state as victor and protector. Originally from the Egyptian city of Heliopolis, obelisk of St. Peter was removed and transferred to Alexandria by the Emperor Augustus as a trophy of Roman conquest over Egypt. Emperor Caligula later removed the obelisk from Alexandria and took it to Rome at the turn of the first century BCE. It was in Rome that the obelisk acquired um, the aforementioned globe, uh, said to hold the ashes of Caesar, um, but actually was most likely a reference to the Circus of Nero that took place in the present-day Basilica of St. Peter, where this obelisk has stood since 1586. The Vatican obelisk was not only a symbol of the shifting centers of Roman power, it was a potent public spectacle, and its erection proved to be a popular curio. As Brian Curran writes, during the papacy of Sixtus V from 1585 to 1590, a dramatic new form of popular entertainment caught with the Roman imagination great feats of engineering involving transport and erection of obelisks. And that's what's depicted here is the, the kind of uh, engineering mastery of moving this great thing across the land and then propping it up. In the 1890s, the Pacific Ocean Monument retained at least a part of the globe ornament, but most of the others had deteriorated into piles of rubble or had been destroyed by ranchers and indigenous peoples. Along with removing, uh, renovating and protecting the larger monuments at each terminal of the land border, the second boundary commission was tasked with installing new cast iron monuments at greater intervals. At just over six feet tall, the new monuments retain the familiar obelisk form, albeit much thinner, and were designed to be more resilient to the elements and easier to transport over land. Each of the 250 plus cast iron monuments were anchored in Portland cement, and most of which were the obelisk form might appear incongruous with the desired goal of marking an international border, 
But the U.S.-Mexico monuments were designed similar to those previously placed along the northern border of the United States to mark the boundary between American and British territorial control. And there was also kind of smaller, about one foot height um, forms that marked the Mason-Dixon line. Um, the monuments themselves did little to maintain the demarcation of the border in terms of controlling uh, crossings of people or goods. Instead, they adopted historic formal symbolism of the obelisk and deployed it in the border of that region. As Brian Curran and others have described, obelisks, obelisks have always represented a type of power linked to the state and its right as sovereign. And while the nature of power has been differentiated through the millennia of obelisk erection, the simple form of a taper pillar topped with a small pyramid has long been associated with representations of imperial state legitimacy and strength. For the Egyptians, that power was registered in the ecclesiastical order of the sun gods. For the Romans, it represented Roman Empire and later the Catholic Church. For the French, it was the power of the Enlightenment, uh, rationality, and the triumph of liberalism. And for the Americans, the obelisk came to signify republicanism, democracy, and America's imperial ambitions. At the dedication of the Washington Monument, which is still the world's largest uh, or tallest obelisk, construction of which began during the U.S.-Mexico War and was completed just prior to the final boundary survey commission, Congressman Robert C. Winthrop said, among other things, that compact, consolidated structure with its countless blocks inside and outside held firmly in position by their own weight and pressure will ever be an instructive type of the national strength and grandeur which can only be secured by the union of many in one." Unquote. What the boundary monuments lack in size, at least compared to the one in Washington, they gain in repetition and regularity. The cast iron obelisk utilized a production process perfect for making exact copies, yet far from the monumental obelisk of antiquity. The pillars of Egypt were seen to contain and stabilize their representation of power through material embodiment to the extent that the obelisk itself was that was what was removed, transported, rededicated to new gods and men. In the American context, the form of the obelisk denoted sovereign claims of power, mythology of the state, and the force of cadastral authority. But each copy held the same status as the original. Thus, the myth of the state could be manufactured and distributed by industrial means. Since the first boundary survey, producing images of the border had been integral to both materializing the border as an object and transmitting border narratives and discourses. The line on the map and the division of space needs something reproducible and exchangeable in order to hold their discursive and political power. The initial boundary survey included etchings of each monument, and since that time, photographic technology became the medium of boundary documentation, and images of the border have been produced and distributed since the late 19th century. Along with the 1891 survey, uh, monuments crew two photographers, Daniel Payne from the United States and Luis Servin from Mexico, accompanied the teams to document the surveying process and catalog each monument for a complete photographic archive. It was the first photographic survey of the entire boundary line, and likely the first time much of the region had been systematically photographed. Historian Catherine Morrissey writes that Payne had previous experience working with his brother as a commercial photographer and painter in Los Angeles. While Servine was largely unskilled in photography, uh, even if he had been previously exposed to survey photography while working the Mexico Guatemala boundary. Though neither Payne nor Servine uh, were chosen exclusively for the photographic skills or prior photography experience, making images was an important part of reestablishing the boundary line and documenting the region's geography. The two photographers worked alongside the surveying and monuments team, often in conjunction with those efforts, producing a complete record of each monument erected during the survey. Compiled in its own album and published in conjunction with the official boundary commission report, the document portrays each of the 258 obelisks installed during the second survey. The difference between the two photographers' skills um, and training can be readily gleaned. Servine's photos are less technically proficient while showing that Morrissey describes as a, quote, narrative vignette, unquote. Images that include survey members, worksite conditions, and construction in progress. The monuments often appear at angle, uh, sometimes slightly askew. In contrast, Payne's images show the work of a more technically skilled photographer, and therefore his images make up about two-thirds of the published uh, monument documentation. The difference between the two is most apparent in images of Monument 222, taken by Servine, on the left here. 
uh, and, uh, and an image, uh, oh, in this image, a figure identified as Payne is walking towards Hervey. Monument 222 is in the center of the frame, shot from an angle and is listing slightly to the right. With a large bush situated within the same photographic plane, the horizon line cuts through both Payne's head and the top of the monument. Payne's camera is oriented towards the face of the obelisk. The angle is different, difficult to decipher, but the horizon line likely does not cut through any of the monuments identifying information. And so far, um, I've not been able to locate that image, the one that Payne took of the same one. Payne's image for Monument 183, in contrast, positions a monument squarely in the center of the frame, its designation prominently featured, with a dramatic landscape receding behind. The subject of the image is clearly rendered. Payne's, quote, artistic sensibility, unquote, according to Morrissey, includes awareness of perspective and the landscape genre. With experience as both a painter and photographer, Payne would have been exposed to prevailing techniques in both artistic traditions, including normative modes of perspective and composition. Through the mid-19th century, photography had been an important means of documenting and consuming America's expansion westward. Images of Yosemite, and the great landscapes of the West were reproduced and sold throughout the country. And many of them relied on prevailing and well-established tropes adopted in landscape photography from painting itself uh, a means of imperial documentation. The methods of composition and perspective that Payne would have been adapted and well-situated to form were, as Martin Berger writes, forms of aesthetic representation that come with, quote, being white. They had been translated from landscape painting and were deeply enmeshed with, as Morrissey says, the landscape genre. Beyond the tropes used by the artist and documentarian, the proliferation of landscape images also constructs the perceptual capacity of an awaiting audience. So in that sense that it's producing not just the images, but also the way the audience receives it, the way that we as a public would, would kind of uh, interrogate and consume these images. By the end of the 19th century, Burgerite's landscape genre's symbolic power was sufficiently ingrained in the European-American mind that it constructed white, a white interpretation of the world as a kind of dominant visual field. Two important visual tropes conditioning the image's interpretive resonance are the prominence of the monument at the center of the frame, and for pain at least, the emphasis on a depopulated landscape. The combination constructs a simple image wherein the monument dominates the frame and its surrounding context. The land is rendered open, free of people of prior settlement, and ready to be developed. According to Berger, the aesthetic tropes of elevating subjects by framing them within the center of the composition were well established by the end of the 19th century. It is a simple and almost straightforward move, but differed slightly from other framing devices and more gestural compositions that would balance the prominence of different landscape objects or lead the eye through unbalanced compositions. Here the center is dominated by the formation of the state. The obelisk, including all of its symbolism, stands dominant within the landscape. The second trope, that of an unpeopled vista, would have also formed part of Payne's photographic and painterly knowledge. The presence of other figures, subjects, or evidence thereof undercuts the image claim of an unspoiled nature and troubles the developmental logic of expansionism. An open landscape is ripe for exploitation. The presence of the monument, the pure geometric shape encroaches the seemingly natural landscape, would seem to trouble this formation. But it also serves to link the natural order, quote unquote, of the landscape with the state. Here the state is ingrained with the landscape and yet dominates it. Both the state and sovereign forms are seen as sprouting from the American West, an abstract projection of power that becomes naturalized as part of the geographic terrain. The monument image construction positions the American state as both prehistoric formation of the land and as a stable imperial power over it. It also serves to mediate the existing aesthetic tropes of landscape image making with a new aesthetic expectation of boundary line and the border region. As a cultural object that still occupies a central position within American political discourses, boundary architectures continue to inspire artistic and documentary imagery. The particular composition sensibilities of Payne's images can be seen in images of the border present. For instance, Francisco Cantu's best-selling and controversial book, The Line Becomes River, Dispatches from the Border, uses an image from renowned photographer Richard Misrak on its cover. Using similar visual composition, Misrak's images 
uh, center the boundary fence within an unpeopled landscape. The photograph illustrating the cover titled Wall, Brownsville, Texas, is part of Mr. Rock's larger border cantos project. Many of the images use similar aesthetic compositions to document the boundary line and associated boundary objects. Similarly, David Taylor, a photographer who has documented the border for decades, recreated the encyclopedic efforts of the Boundary Commission uh, album in its own book, Monuments. So the book on the left is from the National Archive, and that's um, the kind of bound collection of all the, the black and white uh, monuments. And David Taylor's on the right. So the same, same size um, and kind of like same aesthetic to the, the, the book design. He describes the relation, David Taylor, describes the relation between landscape and its representation as a type of orientation progress process, though difficult to discern. Uh, quote, even if you know roughly where the border is, it can be difficult to spot on the landscape. From the distance, then, it seemingly materializes. It has to do with the way visual cues lead your eye. Whether defined by a dirt track, cattle fencing, or formidable steel and concrete interventions, once your view is roughly parallel with the border, its path across the land is readily discerned. At proximity, it also becomes clear that it is an imposition on an otherwise contiguous space. Taylor suggests the monuments and the photographic representation serve to orient the viewer within an otherwise indiscernible landscape, which is certainly the intent of the monuments and other boundary line constructions. I contend that another aspect of this orientation process is positioning the image within the cultural discourse of boundary politics and the discursive power of the border as a contested space. Yet by situating image-making practices within the historic aesthetic of landscape photography and painting, the dominant form of boundary image-making reinforces the heroic stature and natural right of American sovereignty across contested lands. The aesthetics are not neutral, coming out of a tradition that establishes aesthetic production and viewing habits fortified by the racialized logics of domination, emptiness, and the promise of manifest destiny. In late May 2020, <clears throat> hundreds of thousands of people gathered in cities across the United States to protest racialized violence and the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, amongst many others. In addition to justice and accountability, many protesters demanded the removal of monuments dedicated to Confederate soldiers and other figures tied to histories of American violence and dispossession. Anthropologist and Egyptologist Sarah Parchek offered some helpful advice to protesters calling for the removal of the Confederate Soldiers and Sailors Monument, a 52-foot uh, tall obelisk in Birmingham's, Birmingham, Alabama's Lynn Park, named after Charles Lynn, himself a Confederate officer, and seen here providing a backdrop to Theodore Roosevelt's uh, 1911 address to the National Child Labor Committee Conference. Parchin tweeted her image with helpful instructions, including advice on rope length, the number of people needed, and a reminder for everyone to wear gloves. Birmingham Mayor Randall Woodfin uh, joined Partrick's call, or perhaps she joined his, telling a crowd gathered to pull down the obelisk, allow me to finish the job for you. Then and the next day he did, but rather than pulling down by force, the city dismantled it piece by piece. Partrick's final directive, once the obelisk had been toppled, was to celebrate. Good riddance, she wrote on Twitter, to any obelisk pretending to be ancient Egyptian obelisks when they are in fact celebrating racism and white nationalism. About two weeks later, decolonize this place, uh, an action-oriented movement in decolonial formation in New York City and beyond, uh, reformatted Partrick's Twitter thread and, and drawing into a free-to-download digital poster. The obelisk from Partrick's original drawing, made in reference to the Confederate uh, monument in Birmingham, was redrawn in finer detail, including the inscription, Racist Monument, which you can see sort of here in the cursive script. What, has been a, what had been a specific racist monument uh, became a symbol for all racist monuments, including the entire edifice of Confederate monumentation. A symbol, uh, uh, Confederate monumentation that rarely relied on the obelisk form, uh, preferring instead figurative statuary men, especially men on horses, to do the work of disassociating the lost cause from slavery. Less than 20 miles uh, southeast of Eloy, Arizona, where many of the pictures from previous slides have been taken, 
And about 100 miles northwest of Nogales lies Pikachu, P Pikachu uh, Peak State Park. In 1984, the Children of the Confederacy, United Daughters of the Confederacy, and the Arizona Historical Society built an obelisk-like stone pillar to commemorate the Battle of Pikachu Pass, the, quote, westernmost battle of the Civil War. A plaque on the obelisk notes the defeat of 13 Union soldiers by 10 Confederate cavalrymen, delaying Union advancement, and hastening the establishment of Arizona territory. The stone pillar looks much like the quickly assembled, quickly assembled obelisk built by the First Boundary Commission, a large pile of nearby stone held together with simple mortar, albeit less perfectly rectilinear. The monument is similar in scale and construction to Boundary Monument 129, which still stands guard about 60 miles to the south. And this is the same, that's the same image from before that, the dog on it, which is taken from a different angle, this one's being facing north and west. Um, as part of the George Floyd protests and their larger Black Lives Matter movement, activists repeated calls on Arizona's, Arizona's governor, Doug Ducey, to remove the Confederate monument. In July 2020, after months of inaction, a brass plaque commemorating the monument um, as a Confederate totem was stolen. The stone obelisk, however, still remains to this day. Thank you. I think there's not exactly another format, but if you have questions, I'm going to ask. Yeah, I'm going to ask stupid and crazy one, but like the whole idea of showing power through obelisk is that it's one pure stone, right? So isn't it a bit weird that the like, it's we see it so much in America, right? That you take the aesthetic, but the whole idea behind it is gaping most in translation. Like the Egyptian obelisk was carved yeah. out of one piece, and that was part of the production process. Yeah, yeah. and so it's been reduced like, little by little from like one piece to accumulations of stone, and then passing it. It's a totally different. So it's, I think that's, yeah, that's sort of what I'm trying to figure out, that the form itself contains all the mythologies and all the kind of aspirations of the political organization, what, whatever that organization is, whether it's a state or kind of religious order, and that it's the form that carries that, um, and the production process can be swapped out uh, in myth, the kind of mythology. Is stable in a way. You were saying that these same kind of markers are used in the northern border as well. Was using it? Was that when were those started to be established? Oh, the Northwest Ordinance was before. I should probably know this a lot better than I do. Yeah, they, they came with the treaties. So every yeah, time absolutely. every time the treaties were, yeah, yeah, the yeah. country between the British and the Northwest Ordinance was signed, which I believe was like 1830s, it yeah, came right. um, Then survey teams were sent out to map and market. Right? This was a part, I think, um, in some of the other research, um, other parts of the project, looking at those survey teams, right, as this advancement of knowledge, where most of this territory was completely unknown to the American state, like Washington, and kind of forms of power. They just they had no idea what was there. And so part of it is um, in the, the vein of these kind of exploratory commissions to go out and document. So along with these photographs and drawings of the border, there's um, anthropological studies of the kind of indigenous peoples, um, and there's studies of um, cacti and pine cones. And it's like a, a real overview and kind of trying to, to rationalize those landscapes into something that can be known back in Washington. Um, <clears throat> How does this like historical photography and like documentation of the Border fitted into the contemporary documentation? Like, what is there some kind of difference, or are they always like you were mentioning the book has always kind of cite 
like those photographers and their techniques, or do you notice like a different way of capturing and creating <coughs> that? Yeah, it's a good question. I think that there's so uh, with, with the argument I think I would make the, from the first boundary so in the 1850s, the 1890s. Um, there were forms of representation that were established, right? Etchings, drawings, photographs. And that set a template for the way, not just that the border was documented, and it, that's, it's like a trajectory. So you see Richard Misrock's images, David Taylor, and the way in which um, parts of um, the border lands are documented to this day. When you go to the New York Times, they have photo stories about it. You know, very similar, right? This kind of vast emptiness and these small objects. Um, but I think it also sets up a way of consuming the boundary through media. That it's that it required that establishing control over the territory required a sort of mediatic representation of that. That you had to say like that the state was very interested in saying this boundary exists. It's real. Right? And this is how we mark it. And that has been a kind of similar project. And then the, the way that those images get translated and pushed through different narratives, I think for me, is one of the important questions that I'm continuing to develop. Right? That the border has such a strong narrative device, but it can do everything. All of our hopes and dreams and fears and, um, can be hung on our image, um, both of aesthetic, but also a kind of narrative cultural image of the border. And so tracing how that works for me is part of the, the question. Uh, and it can go different directions. I don't think there's necessarily one version of it. Uh, but there's, I think, a few dominant threads. Do you have much documentation about, like, just like Taylor and Mizrock both more on the art side. Yeah. They're doing journalistic versions of it, but then Obviously, somebody from some government entity has to go and like document like wall production and stuff like that. Yeah, there are. It hasn't kind of filtered. So um, this is also part of my preamble. That I did. I'm like not interested in Donald Trump's wall. <laughs> so there's a lot. There's like a lot of that, and there's there's been many times um, the what we think of as like the wall was first installed in the like late 70s to 80s and then really into the 90s. Yeah. And those were pieces of sheeting that were like leftover military um, kind of, they were like runway systems. Um, and those were the first bits of like actual, what we think of as a wall fencing. Um, and there are some documentation of that, but there has been a lot of effort to document like the Trump era. Yeah. But this is, I think would be, I would claim that that's exactly the point, that there's a political utility to that documentation and him going to the border and, you know, signing the, the plaque. And then, you know, like everyone, all the house leaders have to go down and, you know, Biden goes down and Trump goes down and they go on the same day and they have this like contest over it. So there is a lot, there's a lot of government documentation on it. There's also um, the, like, they're registered in the historic, um, like register store places databases and there's maintenance they have to go and paint them and you know patch it up so there are some other documentations that I that I've kind of built into the archive but I'm trying to avoid Donald Trump and how would you like tell about that you're trying to avoid Donald Trump in your research would you just <laughs> Blank out, say I'm not interested in this. Or like, yeah. how would you do that? Well, that's a, so. This is like this is like my anxieties about um, this project is that I don't. I mean, I have to care about Donald Trump to the extent that I do. But that um, for me, it's interesting that this was like the the rhetoric and the political narratives and the documentation, the images of the border and the border as a media, um, as a kind of media space and media object and a form of media in and of itself were long established by the time he came around. And so I think, um, like anything, he's more of a, a kind of, he's parasitic on that, has picked up something that exists um, and amplified it to a certain extent. So for me, the, 
project is interesting in that it uncovers um, the kind of long trajectory of infrastructure and construction and architecture on the on the boundary as you know from the time like the first barbed wire went up in the 19 early 1900s 1920s fencing and migrant prisons and labor camps that there's a lot of there's a lot of infrastructure um, around the, the border that is not not necessarily linked to just a wall um, or to the kind of latest iteration but I would think of it as a a kind of cycle, right? Like it's another version, and it might be a particular version. It might have its own forms of violences and kind of virulent in its own way. Um, but it's, I wouldn't say it's new in that sense. So, yeah. Um, do, these, do these monuments have like a network of maintenance to go along with them? I know you said one of them was um, cut up by force of the Confederacy. But I know I assume they take care of that monument, but I guess the ones that have been up for a very long time, who takes care of them? Yeah, they're under the auspices, uh, well, they've transferred. Um, but there's still a, a boundary commission, the US-Mexico boundary commission, that it mostly deals with like water rights and waterways, but they have, they have kind of jurisdiction over a lot of questions of the boundary. And so they'll send teams out there and they'll kind of make sure they're up and you know, maintain them to a certain extent. Um, there's a, you know, this is a kind of overlapping jurisdictions between the International Boundary, International Boundary Water Commission, Border Patrol, of course, um, certain um, uh, immigration services. They're the ones who do it. And then there's, you know, the historic, like the ones in the land terminal, like, um, Near Juarez will be um, those have kind of a historic designation. So we'll, we'll go through like that aspect of the state. That's, that's my question. Um, I'm reminded of uh, Von Kruger's account of the Golden Spike in the uh, King of Empires tracks, like Leland Sanford taking a swing at. Um, uh, the Golden Spike that is supposed to kind of ceremonially commemorate the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, and he misses. Uh, but they take a photograph, and uh, in the photograph it appears that he's done it, and the photograph circulates, and that's more important than the actual right. action. I'm thinking about the sort of function of photography of these monuments, where if you showed evidence of monuments that were actually destroyed or um, weren't actually asserting dominion, or um, there's a disparity between this sort of image that is projected of control and that reality of how the, the border operates or fails to sort of consolidate American sovereignty. I guess I wonder um, how do you position yourself relative to Monica America in terms of a sort of, it seems like a claim about the failure of American sovereignty or the yeah. tendency of American sovereignty is central. How would you yeah, that's think good. about that relative to him? I mean, I think, I think that there's an affinity, certainly, in that thinking and um, in the way that this is a form of failure, that every, every cycle, every turning of the cycle um, broadcasts other forms of failure. And that for every, when it goes from pyramid to cast iron, to barbed wire, to the military fencing, to the wall, to the electronic surveillance systems, to the LIDAR, to the blimps. There's like a whole series of blimps that just kind of float aimlessly tethered to the ground in Arizona and Texas. Um, drones, um, like I, I conceive of that as like, as another, another instance of failed sovereignty and I think this is where it ties in with some of my other research that like I, I gave a talk last semester that is much more on this question of like failure. Um, that sovereignty is an ever failing process. Like it's not, it's actually not possible to be sovereign, like a state nor an individual. Um, but these are all the kind of visual tropes that a state would produce in order to project sovereignty when in fact it's not, it's not, a, there's nothing real about it. Uh, and the, the idea that it kind of that these images sort of meander through the media and they have the golden spike, right? Like um, that that's 
Like that's the thing that you want. You want the picture of it. And uh, in the original survey, the the the, the point near uh, near Juarez was like not even close to where it should have been. But they had a big party and they they took a piece of the Washington Monument and they buried it in the ground. And you know, like newspapers came and wrote about it. And it was this big thing where they had all the commissioners and they cracked champagne against. It. Like so, it had that. Like if they would have. They had it. Photography would have existed. They would have definitely photographed it and sent it around to the wire services. Um, but they just had to manufacture it in some way. Um, so I think that this is kind of meandering. Um, in the larger scope of it, I do see these as um, as instances of failure. Like that, that is an ongoing, ever-present project. I mean, because the the United States also can't just say, like, actually, it's, we can't do it. Like, there's no such thing as state sovereignty. Um, that would, they just wouldn't do that. So you have to kind of keep keep doing the things that you're going to do to provide security or whatever. Yeah. But I find it super interesting is when you sh when you show how, mm -hmm. how like, this one, I forgot the name, how it, how we photographed to show the monumentality. It's also a tool to actually kind of flip the coin, I guess. And do you know of a lot of artists who then use it as a tool to deconstruct this idea of sovereignty? Because I remember, well, at least, in the, I have a Palestinian artist, I forgot the name. For example, it has a painting where a small kid is jumping, like you see only the tip of the wall and they jump, a kid is jumping like freely over it, kind of breaking the idea of, mar of dominance and sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Do you know of artists who use, like who use your research, like not your, your research, but the idea of your research, to then dismiss this idea of dominance. I, I mean, I don't know. Yes. I mean, in terms of the artists on the border, specifically, um, it's become like the, the the border was also conceived as as uh, kind of art practice in and of itself. So especially around Nogales, you would see uh, installations and, and use it. And there's, there's been exhibitions about um, things that, like, using the border itself as a kind of media for producing other artistic practices. Um, and it's, but it's, it's much more difficult because it's become a much more highly militarized space. So even doing this research, you know, I, you know, I have to go and interface with Border Patrol all the time. <coughs> Um, across getting over across the boundary uh, is much more difficult. But there's uh, I forget his name. I can talk to you after class. But there's a guy, uh, a photographer, a kind of conceptual artist, and he's working in Mexico uh, on the border. And he's been doing a lot of work on mining and stuff. So there are people that it's still a very rich it's site, right? It's a site. Are there any um, so like uh, intelligence behind? Uh, uh, behind, uh, like, uh, like where these um, ob ob obelisks are uh, sort of like placed, it's sort of like random roads around that, uh, uh, along the sort of border, because you mentioned is this, you mentioned that uh, like originally the ob obelisk was sort of supposed to be like a public spectacle. It's are those sort of being placed around some sort of, sort of infrastructures, or cities, or anything? Yeah, the first commission, they um, there was like a great deal of them along the California line, just because that was easier. I mean, there's a lot of limitations on how you actually build these things in the 1950s. Um, and then there were like huge distances. But now I think it's pretty regular. So they use like surveying to kind of mark them. Uh, in terms of the spectacle, I, I would, for me it's that like the image then becomes a spectacle. That the, the need to document is a spectacle rather than Rather than gathering a public around the consecration of a monument, you actually take the monument and show it. Like you distribute, it. so it's a kind of reversal of it. But the notion of of the spectacle is maintained. It's just that the means of distribution <laughs> have created. That would be my argument. There are. I mean, there's interesting cases where some of the 
uh, monuments or like right next to a building or something. Or um, there's like a, a saloon in Arizona that used to that built itself right on the border. So there was like a, a monument, and then you could walk in from the Mexico side and like get a drink, and then they would give it to you out the window. So it's like it's like like a tax it's like a tax haven. Like early forms of that, like getting away from the law, because the boundary is also this weird space where its governance is contested. Um, so you, you saw cases like that where you would build up all along the border and have kind of other illicit trade of people and goods and services that could go in one door and out the other. That's interesting. But it kind of makes me think of the uh, the part the Barcelona Pavilion. Well, the way it was being like Im constantly imaged and the image being reproduced, nobody even cares that's, if that's the original thing or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing that was kind of striking is like in the nineteen in the eighteen sixties one, you're you're going, you're surveying, you're just building it on site, and then you move to manufacturing it. So you're basically building the border somewhere inside the country and moving the border. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were they were made in uh, Mexico, and, or they were made in New Mexico. Also, some of them were forged in Boston. Shipped like overland. It was a huge. I mean, it was a huge infrastructural project. It's like, yeah, you know, you're just producing. I mean, the border is now legitimately a product of industry, and not just. Yeah, yeah. It's always been a kind of global space, right? Yeah. Like all the serving equipment, um, they was made in France, and they had to wait for that to show up. And they had to wait for certain equipment to be invented and brought in part of the land. It was forged in, in parts all over the world. So yeah, it's, it's always the U.S. Mexico war, especially, has always been a site of kind of global accumulation. Various, various Can you have a question? Then I have a question. Yeah, we were talking about um, I have a question about technology. Because as you were talking about the success of the forms of water, I was also kind of thinking about like some of those earlier photos um, were kind of like convergent with like our way of doing photography. So like I'm wondering how also like just resource limitations, like who those images reached because and like how how they like um, how they persist or don't persist, I guess, because yeah. it seems that each border regime only works when, like, we kind of, like, as a, we as in, like, people living within borders or whatever, kind of don't, like, understand how it works, it seems. Like, I was trying to, like, okay, now drones and not let me, like, maybe drop some, like, stuff that I don't think you know about. And it's like, but then, like, that image only works if you actually understood the mechanism and like the, what they're saying about the borders. So I'm wondering, like, even though now we can definitely kind of trace that kind of, of like, kind of scan of empire and these photos, like, concurrently in time, how do these documents operate? And then what does that mean for, like, new modes also? Because, like, I'm also thinking of, like, the photographer, the like, Trevor, Trevor Penguin, and, like, you know, does all this like computation of weird military sites and stuff, and like it, it's like very complex. And he's definitely speaking about power, but like to be honest, I can't read those images because they're so advanced. Um, and so yeah, I'm just like wondering how you're thinking about like situating for our um, like yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I If I understand it correctly, um, one aspect of asking like how they were understood at the time, and that's what I'm currently working on is trying to figure out were these um, were these images solely for an archival purpose, um, documentation purpose, or were they also did they get kind of cycled out into some sort of media? Were they in local pamphlets, and flyers, and newspaper articles? Um, the technology to reproduce images um, at a mass scale like that was um, recent at best. Um, so, so far I have not been able to come up with instances where in the 1850s or in the uh, 
1990s, those images became mass consumption objects in and of themselves. Um, so there's a type of kind of state formation project that I think those participated in for a long time. Even at the same time, they, they built a kind of knowledge system and a kind of means of representing that were accessible and are accessible within uh, New York photographers of contemporary, uh, contemporary practice. In terms of photographers like um, Trevor Paglin, I don't know, that's a good question. Uh, his work is so, you know, it's it's kind of using, um, I always understand his work as a type of um, surveillance, right, that, um, that you just flip the camera around or you find a perch uh, that's on public land and hook up a telescope and then you can see a kind of military base or you're tracking X-Link or Starlink or whatever it's called um, as a way of, of understanding kind of perpetual surveillance, um, turn it around, elucidate it. Um, and so, I don't know, yeah, I'd be interested. It's a, it's a good question. Like, how, how would you use contemporary photographic practices to kind of counter? Um, there are certainly um, surveillance systems that are being deployed on the, the border at the moment. So part of that can be utilized. I was just wondering because you know the two sets of images of interest are the two photographers who are at the same moment, mm -hmm. right? Are they serving at the same time? Oh, I guess you said they are. But the serving in pain? Yeah. Yeah, they were they working together. Like, I think you know you know the art is incorporated like the laser installing it and mm -hmm. the it's less professional so it's like a very different approach. It's, it, I think it, that incident is like really interesting. I'm just curious like why they commissioned two people to do the same. Yeah, I haven't been able to figure that out. I often wonder that myself. Um, usually what happened is the commissions were formed, um, you know, one was formed in the United States, one was formed in Mexico, and they kind of met. And so the, the picking and choosing of who was going to be on those was left to the kind of metropoles. Um, but so, those of them are American, right? No, one's a Mexican, oh, okay. and one's American. And so often they had, they kind of like, it was just like similar team composition, commission composition, just like one was from Mexico, one was from the United States. So. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah, that was just. What makes you want to study the uh, these objects? What's that? What, what makes you want to study them? Oh, what makes me? Well, I'm just interested in the, this prehistory of the border, like the prehistory of border architecture, mm -hmm. and that just starts it starts with the obelisk, right? Um, and why, like, why was it? Why did they feel the need to document it in such a way? Like, why was that important to? I understand the idea of building, taking piles of rocks and like stacking them up, but then you had to have someone who made an etching of it, like a pile of rocks. So there's something very strange about that to me. Like, why is that in and of itself like an important thing to document? At the same time, you're trying to survey the land and make maps and do these sort of scientific studies of people and um, yucca and like right like you had to actually and it makes up a large portion of both these conditions that it's published separately so i find it i don't know i just find it fascinating that there's these books from the 1890s about the border and it's just pictures of these 250 feet of these stupid iron things in a landscape but they're sort of decontextualized. And they're they're really weird. Like they're and there's but there's so much, like there's so much archival energy put towards documenting the monuments, not the borderlands, not the people, not the towns, but like the monuments itself. I mean, those things exist in certain capacities, other locations, but I, I don't know. I have, it's found it so peculiar that there's just so much energy put into like, documenting them in that way, in like such a robust way. I mean, on top of that, I kind of interest in that. And then, like, 
the composition of them. They're very, they're, they're just very particular. They're very carefully considered documents. Are there any other like kind of superseding border documentation systems of other, you know, other border uh, empire imperial movements, or is this really kind of something that's emergent with this particular like? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, there <clears throat> the monuments themselves, like um, the old boundaries of. Rome, right? The, the pyramids are still there. Like those were originally like the, the lines that um, decimated kind of tax collecting status. So there are these similar methods uh, and similar forms, but I don't know if there's like other like bound archives or collections of like boundaries from other places. Probably that's a good question. I should. Yeah, like, there's a very similar sort of like thing happening with the Alamo Battle Monument. That's sort of like there's this one particular um, historical instance of like this what happened at the particular day of the particular battle that's been circulated through its imagery, sort of like how the way it's portrayed in different mediums through like beginning with cinema towards even the ornament, the the sort of like the postcards of the gift shops that like constructs a very particular like view of sort of like the Texas and Mexican history. So it kind of makes me wonder if, which exactly like really similar to sort of like the narrative that you touched on with the monumentality of the obelisk of the border itself. So yeah, it makes me wonder if this is like a Texas regional phenomena or is there are like other uh, territories that deal with the question in a similar way. I, yeah, I mean, Texas, the, the amount of effort that Texas has done to rewrite its independence uh, is legion. So I don't know if it's particular to the region, but I do you know that the, like as a state interest, I mean, all states have their own myths. And I think for the United States, so the, the kind of preceding research in this that leads to the monument is like about the war and how it started, and, and but also about where the lines were. And so there's a lot of, there was a lot of um, contestation about where to actually draw the line, um, particularly, I mean, about race, like um, which states were gonna be slave states and which were not, and how do you differentiate that? How much of Mexico, how many Mexicans do we want? as part of the union. So like that was the overall consideration about how to draw the line. That to me is part of the like state mythology as a kind of racial geographic project that is then kind of like baked into the monuments, right? So it starts actually before that. And so that I think for me, there's a long trajectory of state mythologies that are part of this kind of aesthetic landscape. Um, and I would imagine, I did not to get into like this particular sort of weird Texas history, but there's also the kind of Texas independence myth making that is alongside that. At the same time, right, that um, Texas is as an independent republic and you know, we need to secede and all that sort of stuff uh, that still takes precedent over actual history. Um, do you ever think about the irony of like, like by clearly defining a line, like you're essentially drawing a line for people to cross. Does that make sense? So like, in a way, it's like kind of like an invitation to be trespassed because before the line was defined, people were probably moving in and out without thinking too much of it. Yeah. But like the more you like try to make it real and you police it and you surveil it, like the line becomes more and more real. And then so you, you kind of said, like, prophesizing your own, like, I don't know, like, people coming in. Yeah. Do you find it kind of, like, funny that that happens? I mean, I think that it's, especially the land border is so artificial, right? Um, that there was, and it was a contiguous space. Like, there's just, like, a, a cut across, um, 
across a land that has no real, there's no real meaning to the line itself. And so I think there's, I don't know if I would say that the line invites people to cross it, but the line does not stop people from crossing because there's too much history of cultural, like the, like Mexico as a state and indigenous peoples and uh, Mexican settlers and Americans. Like there was just no concept that that line is real and necessary. And so the, the, the project has been to kind of make it so, but it's, I think it's, that's like, it's an impossibility. That's a, it's a kind of perpetual failure. There's nothing that, there's no amount of architecture that can be put on the line that makes it real in that sense. Like it just doesn't, it just doesn't work. That's a good place to end it. <laughs> Failure. Uh, thank you all. I appreciate the comments.